Hello and uh, welcome to worship with us here at St Andrew's Church of Scotland, Brussels. Today is the 26th of March and in case you forgot, your watches and clocks should have gone forward uh, an hour last night here in Europe uh, anyway. The title of our service today is Flesh and Bone. And for once, for a change, we'll be looking at two passages which the lectionary suggests for us to, to study. One about bones in Ezekiel and the other about flesh in Paul's letter to the Romans at chapter 8. In the picture story, we're looking at something that happened just a day or two before Jesus was crucified, when he washed his disciples' feet. And we learn something there about leadership and service. First, though, I invite you to join in the call to worship with the words in bold. Hear me, O Lord, and answer me, for I am poor and needy. Guard my life, for I am faithful to you. Save your servant who trusts in you. You are my God. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I call to you all day long. Bring joy to your servant, Lord, for I put my trust in you. You, Lord, are forgiving and good, abounding in love to all who call to you. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Listen to my cry for help. Amen. Our opening hymn is In Christ Alone My Hope Is Found. Let us worship God. Bye. 
Let us still our wandering minds in the presence of the Lord God Almighty and settle down to pray. Our Heavenly Father, these are uncertain and increasingly unsettling times. Bad news seems to arrive thick and fast from all corners of the world. The big nations are indulging in ever more strident saber rattling, while Putin's Russia doggedly presses on with its invasion of Ukraine despite the mounting loss of life on both sides of the conflict. The international financial system is jittery with banks collapsing or at risk of collapse, thus spreading additional economic difficulty, hardship and strife all over the world. Many of us feel overwhelmed by these events, caught up in anxiety, fears and doubts. Please help us to remember, Sovereign Lord, that you are always by our side, sustaining us with your grace and loving kindness. Indeed, we thank you that you are with us now as we gather together for this Sunday service to worship you, both online and in the church. Stir up within us the gift of faith, so that we may not only praise you with our lips, but that we may also boldly follow Jesus with our actions in the way of the cross. But even as we do so, Lord, we confess that our wills are rebellious. Our pride gets in the way of our relationships with you and those around us. We fail to comprehend Jesus' selflessness, and we are puzzled by his humility. Our sin gave him death, even though he gave us life. Our treachery guides us to war, even though he calls us to peace. Heavenly Father, have mercy on us. Find us, we pray, in the forsaken places that our own foolishness has led us to. Our hearts are in need of cleansing. Forgive what we have done and who we have been. Bring us home again and impart within us a new song of joy and celebration. Help us to reflect in our lives the glory of your Son, for he lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We worship, praise and adore you, O Lord our God, using the words that Jesus himself taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Now this is a story written in the Bible by one of Jesus's disciples, one of his helpers, his friends, who was called John. He saw just about everything that happened to Jesus during those three years of ministry. And you'll find it in John chapter 13, if you want to look it up. So Jesus and his friends had a special meal together. Then Jesus wanted to teach them something about how a leader cares for others. He got a bowl of water and a towel. I'm going to wash your feet, Jesus said. His friends were very surprised. Jesus knelt down and began to gently wash their dirty feet and dry them on a towel. And Peter, who of course was one of Jesus's friends, was very upset. And he said, you know, I think this is a servant's job, what you are doing. You are our important leader. You shouldn't be doing this. 
but Jesus was showing them that a good leader isn't too important to do anything for other people. It was Peter's turn. You'll never wash my dirty feet, said Peter, but I am being your true friend. I'm showing you what love and service are. That's what he meant. Then wash my face and hands as well, said Peter. I want to learn how to look after other people the way you do, said Peter. But Jesus said, you know, I don't need to do that. The rest of you is clean. And he washed his feet. And that's a very important story. Just before Jesus died, that happened. It's an important story because it demonstrates to us, it says something to us about what it is to be a Christian, to serve other people, and what it is to be a, le a leader, that you should never think that you're above everybody else, or that something is too low, too dirty, too menial to do. Today's reading is from Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 to 14. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me to and fro among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you only know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked and tendons and flesh appeared on them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophecy to the breath, prophecy, son of man, and say to it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood up on their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and I have done it, declares the Lord. The second reading is from Romans chapter 8, verses 6 to 11. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal being bodies because of his spirit 
who lives in you. Thanks be to God. So this week we're dipping into both the Old Testament and the New Testament to see what they tell us about Lent, about our place in Lent, about where we're at in our walk with God. I hope we'll see how Ezekiel ties in with what Paul wrote to the Romans. And last week we looked at that important historical event in the history of Israel when David the shepherd boy was anointed king. This week we're thrown into the middle of another drama in their history, some 400 years or so later. We're actually in the southern kingdom of Judah, that's to say around Jerusalem, and everything has fallen apart. The kings have failed, people have abandoned their faith, and thousands have been taken prisoner to Babylon. Ezekiel was probably one of them. Thankfully, we've been asked to look at a fairly straightforward passage from Ezekiel. Straightforward, but just a bit gruesome, this valley strewn with human bones. You see, the battle that, battles that led to their exile had been very fierce, with many dead. So when Ezekiel sees in this vision a valley of dry bones, we immediately think of the, the killing fields that had come before. As a punishment to their enemies, generals would sometimes leave the dead unburied for the wild animals and birds to feed on. Gruesome indeed. This isn't a suitable topic for a children's talk, is it? And it becomes the stuff of a nightmare, a horror film maybe, because Ezekiel is walking around these bones strewn on the ground, and then he's told to prophesy to them. And suddenly... The, the silent valley is echoing with the sound of rattling as the bones begin leaping and, and dancing about. Soon they're covered in fresh sinew and then layers of flesh and finally they get nice new skin. But these creatures are not yet alive because there's no breath in them. So Yahweh commands a second sermon from the prophet Ezekiel. This one directed to the breath, the spirit, the wind. Come, breath from the four winds and breathe into these slain that they may live, verse 9, and they come alive. So there's now this vast army of living human beings. The, the, the dry bones have become alive with the power of the Spirit of God. So what's this all about then? It was long interpreted as, as hinting at or even announcing some sort of resurrection from the dead. Nowadays, after a lot of study and scholarship, we don't think so. It's about new life, all right, in the power of the Spirit of God, but it's not about coming back to life after we've died. The passage tells us something about its meaning. Verse 11, then he said to me, Son of man, this is God speaking, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. You see, the people had complained previous prior to this. Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. They believe, they believe themselves to be as good as dead. As Margaret O'Dell puts it, they have dug their graves with the fear that God has left them. So the Lord answers in verse 12, I'm going to open up your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. So for one thing, this is a promise, and Isaiah had a similar promise, that even though everything seems to be lost, their land, their culture, their faith, even God himself seems to be gone, they feel like dead men walking. Nevertheless, nevertheless, Yahweh, Jehovah, God still has a future for them. They are his chosen people and their future will be in the chosen, in the ancient land of Israel. Though God knows Babylon is a long way from Israel, but it will happen. And it did. And of course, the way of our lives is a long way from the way of Jesus. 
That's one reason, wrong reason why we're asked to look at this passage in Lent. We journey with Jesus through Lent, trying to walk with him, but all too often we drift away. We need to rediscover God's way and be refilled with the Spirit of God. In this sense, we too are Ezekiel's dry bones, waiting for a fresh breath of the Spirit to give us sinew and flesh and skin so that we might find hope, become whole again, and indeed live again. I say this because when we read about bones in the Old Testament, of course it doesn't usually mean literal skeleton type bones. In Psalm 31, for instance, he writes, my life is consumed by anguish, my strength fails, and my bones grow weak. He's talking about his deepest essential self. When we read in Psalm 6, my bones are in agony, we shouldn't think that he's got arthritis or something. He means that he's consumed with inner torment. And the other key word here in this passage in Ezekiel is the Hebrew word ruach. It can mean spirit, as in God's spirit, or wind, or breath. And there's a play here on all three meanings. The key to the story as it unfolds is that in order to live, they need not only flesh and skin and sinew, but also breath. Verse 6, I will put breath, ruach, in you, and you will come to life. With God's spirit, anything is possible. Without it, they have just a flesh and blood existence. With his spirit, they have life. So as Ezekiel describes this vision of dry bones to the exiled people, he's saying, this is you. This is you. You are the dry bones. You are, as it were, dead. But God can and will make you come alive again. Now, the word that crumbs up repeatedly in Paul's letter to the Romans isn't bones, but flesh. And just as Ezekiel didn't mean the word literally, neither does Paul. But it's not quite so easy to explain what he means. First, what he doesn't mean is that the flesh is bad. Some early and indeed not so early Christians thought so, but he doesn't say that. He's not saying that it's bad to enjoy the pleasures of the flesh, eating, drinking, sex, hearing music, seeing art. He's not saying that at all. Let me try to explain how I understand the word flesh as Paul uses it. Recently, I read an interesting French novel called Ce qui l'advint du sauvage blanc. Some of you may have read it. The true story of an 18-year-old French sailor called Narcisse Pelletier, who was left stranded on the north coast of Australia in 1844. Somehow he survived among the local native people for 17 years until he was rescued. He describes how life for the local people was very harsh. It was dominated by the need to find food, to kill animals, to eat, to drink. Sex was pretty random. They lived together, but not, he thought, really in community not in families as such. They appeared to have no culture, as Pelletier saw it, very little art, singing, music, and so on. Now, it has to be said this was his point of view, what he reported later. But that way of life, that very basic way of life, really describes what Paul means by flesh, just meeting your basic needs of eating, drinking, reproduction, and so on. So he's obviously not against eating and drinking. It's just that there has to be more to life than that. If, you're, if you only ever think of those things, you're missing something vital. We also have our minds, we have our hearts. Above all, we have our spirits. I think we'd all agree about that, wouldn't we? So it seems that Paul thought that not everyone in the church fellowship in Rome was really, truly, deeply alive and therefore they weren't Christians. Some of them were probably involved in the local religions with much wine drinking and feasting and a very 
free morality. So he writes, verse 7, The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It doesn't submit to God's law, nor can it do so. If all you ever think about is satisfying your basic needs, you allow no room for God in your life. So Alan Brame writes, in a very real sense, flesh refers to all the ways in which we seek to fulfill our needs, our wants, our desires. A life that is dominated by self-centeredness and just achieving our own ambitions. So Paul warns us that when we live a life that's just taken up with getting what we want and getting others to do what we want, we end up choking the life out of ourselves. How many of our sentences begin with I and end in me? A life that's dominated by selfishness leads to spiritual death. We close in on ourselves. Now that's true, I think, but it's not all quite that Paul means. It's surely right that selfishness is bad for us. Morally, it's wrong. But Paul's writing about something more, indeed something deeper than morality. And the key verse, I think, is verse 11. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. That's verse 11. Put simply, in, until we come to faith, we are, as it were, dead. We're like Ezekiel's dry bones. We're also like those native people in Australia that Narcisse Pelletier described. We have bodies that eat and drink and maybe even be merry, but spiritually, we have no life. That's what Paul's saying. And this is actually one of the very basics of faith for us as Christians. Something that John Calvin, by, by, uh, for instance, taught vigorously and persuasively. We need to come alive spiritually. And it's why Christians consider this section of Romans, chapter 8, to be right at the very heart of our faith. If we want to live in the kingdom, we need spiritual life. We need to come alive spiritually. We can't do that on our own. We can't just choose to enter the kingdom. That's not enough. We need God's help. We need the Spirit to get in. So in verse 9, Paul contrasts the realm of the flesh and the realm of the Spirit. Obviously, we need to stay alive. We need to look after ourselves. We need to breathe. We need to drink. We need to eat properly and so on. But if that's all we do, then we lack spiritual life. We're just living in the realm of the flesh. As we enter the final stretch of our Lenten journey, next week is Palm Sunday, Paul offers us a reminder to ensure that we're not completely taken up with the basics of life, that we're not focused solely on our own needs and wishes, that we need to fight, make room for God. And he said that to the Romans, these people who were in the church, don't forget. So he thought that even some people in the church needed to do this, to make space for God. We need to find time to be quiet and still, because those are the moments when we can grow spiritually, when we sense the presence of God more powerfully. So I want to conclude in a slightly different way this week. We sometimes light a candle to signify the light of God, signify hope in the darkness, sometimes to remember someone. For me, a candle is also a symbol of spiritual life. Until it's lit, it's all, well, it's just a candle. But when it's lit, it has this, wonderful light about it. It has energy. It has warmth. We can see our way with it. And spiritual life is like that. We all have the potential for spiritual life, but it needs to be lit. So the question for you and for me is this. Is the candle actually 
lit. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we quiet our hearts and minds, let us focus on the needs of others. Let us pray for those with burdens, which in fact is virtually all of humanity. Please be with those with especially heavy burdens, those who have lost loved ones to war, thinking most particularly of those in Ukraine those who have lost loved ones and all worldly goods in natural disasters, particularly to the victims of flooding in Malawi and the U.S. state of California, as well as those in Turkey, Syria, and Ecuador who continue to struggle in the aftermath of earthquakes. We pray for the countless number of people outside the headlines who suffer because they or those near to them are trapped in life-destroying addictions. We pray for those whose burdens increase daily because of the rise of the cost of living, loss of, employ loss of employment, or eroding benefits. We pray for those who are alone, sick, and afraid. Please, Lord, we pray that these individuals will feel comfort and that each of us, however burdened, will find a way to extend a kind word or helpful gesture. As spring brings new beauty to the Northern Hemisphere, let us be encouraged by the soft, fragrant air and bright colors of your landscape. May we rejoice and find strength in your promise of new life in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Let us rejoice in the community of St. Andrews and the recent gatherings of the International Presbytery and our Excel community at the Jumbo Sale. Thank you for Reverend Foggett, our elders, and every member of our congregation who makes St. Andrews so special. Please, Lord, lead us forward with continued resilience, cooperation, and divine inspiration. In Jesus' name, amen. Spirit of God, come dwell within me. Open my heart, O oh, set me free. Fill me with love for Jesus I hold. Come fill me with living water. Jesus is in me. Jesus.
big thank you as we close to Linda and her team for all the work they put into the, the jumble sale last week. And it was a huge lot of work. So many thank you. Um, a total of well over 800 euros was raised and that will go to the charity that they've chosen, Rolling Douche, providing washing facilities for people living on the streets. And sadly, there are many thousands of them here in Brussels. As we approach the end of Lent, next week is Palm Sunday, so we approach our Easter week services. We have one each evening, Monday through to Friday at 7 p.m. But on Monday, Thursday this year, we join our friends at the IPC for Holy Communion. This year, it's our turn to go to them at the International Protestant Church in Audigam. If you need instructions about how to get there, as ever, just send me a little message and I'll give you the instructions. Then on Easter morning, we invite you to join us for an Easter breakfast. So that's two weeks today. Easter breakfast at half past nine in the morning before the service at 11 o'clock. There'll be a collection at the breakfast and that too will go to the rolling douche auction. The benediction today is one I've adapted from Paul's letter to the Colossians. To God's holy people, wherever you are, faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father, now and always. Amen. <laughs>